develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation, business opportunities anywhere. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need, whenever you need it. Well, it's been a bit of a roller coaster of a week on the markets, and today is no different. Bitcoin is on track for its worst week since 2013. Cryptocurrencies across the board take hits. All the analysis you need coming up. And in the big picture tonight, the Brexit clock is ticking. The divorce date is set for March 2019, but many key issues are still on the table. It comes as calls for Switzerland to nail down its relationship with the UK grow. The head of foreign trade at Economy Swiss warns that Switzerland must act sooner rather than later. We have quite a clear picture where problems might arise. Then we bring this to our governments and tell them, listen, this is your work now. Make sure that there's no gap and that business can continue as it does today. So I'm quite optimistic that this communication work is working, but the outcome at the end right now is not fully guaranteed. Creating a new generation of coders, the CEO of Swiss-based Kodelsky Group thinks that more children should learn how to program software. Andre Kodelsky talks to us in our Newsmaker Hour later about the importance of unlocking our digital potential. Fundamentally, there is a lack of uh, uh, urgency sense regarding the digitalization in Europe and Switzerland in particular. And here I think it will take some time, but it's really important once more that Switzerland is sitting in the driving seat. Good evening and welcome to the Swiss Pulse. I'm Hannah Wise and you're watching The Living Markets. Welcome to the Swiss Pulse. It's Friday the 2nd of February. I'm Hannah Wise and we start tonight with a roundup of all the main news. Well, just last week, its aircraft were protecting airspace above the World Economic Forum. But for the last two days, five of the Swiss Air Force's FA-18 Hornets have been grounded after investigators found cracks in the landing gear. In December, the Swiss government announced plans to spend 8 billion Swiss francs on new fighter jets. That after voters rejected a 3.1 billion Swiss franc order for jets in May back in 2014. Several Swiss banks are refusing to transfer assets belonging to Saudi clients detained during a recent crackdown on corruption. That's according to a report in Geneva newspaper Le Ton. Earlier, reports said that the new Saudi regime under Mohammed bin Salman had pressured clients to repatriate funds from Swiss accounts. The Geneva paper cited sources saying Riyadh planned to confiscate the assets. UBS, Pictet, Lombard Odier and Credit Suisse are among the banks mentioned in the report. An upwards revision of economic growth in Germany could help Chancellor Angela Merkel hammer out a coalition deal with the country's Social Democrats. The government raised its forecast by half a percent after positive economic data pointed to added tax revenues. Talks on ending over four months of political limbo are likely to stretch into next week, however, despite agreements on education, migration and pensions. Well, meanwhile, thousands of industrial workers in Germany are walking off the job, demanding better pay and working hours. It's the third day of 24-hour strikes. Labour union IG Metal is calling for a 6% increase in wages. Mercedes-Benz, Audi and BMW are among the companies affected. Good news this Friday coming from South Africa. After nearly 1,000 gold miners trapped underground 
were finally rescued. The workers at the Sebanyi Stillwater mine were trapped last Wednesday after a power failure prevented elevators from bringing them to the surface. Safety at mines in South Africa has been an ongoing issue, with some 80 recorded fatal fatalities last year. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has announced an ambitious plan to give hundreds of thousands of poor and vulnerable families free health care. The plan, dubbed Modi Care, would cover hospital costs of up to half a million rupees every year, which translates to around 7,800 US dollars. That's more than 15 times the amount poor families can currently claim from the government. Access to health care is a major problem in India, but if the programme gets the go-ahead, it could cost $780 billion, which is a huge part of the country's $2.4 trillion economy. The CEO of Japanese conglomerate Sony is stepping down. After six years at the helm, Kazuo Hirei is handing over the reins to Chief Financial Officer Kenichiro Yoshida. The company is currently heading towards a record year with projected annual profits of 6.6 .6 billion US dollars. Yoshida will start his new role on the 1st of April. CNN's Sharice Pam has more from Hong Kong. The man who saved Sony is making way for a new leader. Sony announcing today that CEO Kazuo Hirai is handing over the reins to Chief Financial Officer Kenichiro Yoshida. Hirai is saying he's dedicated himself to transforming the company and making it profitable, saying it excites me to hear more and more people say that Sony is back again. Hirai has led Sony through a stunning turnaround. When he took over as CEO in 2012, he inherited a business that had not turned a profit in four years. The Japanese company, once known for innovative gadgets like the Walkman, had turned into a stuffy conglomerate. Hirai went about bringing Sony back from the brink. The company now consistently reporting huge profits. And he proved Sony could still be on the cutting edge, introducing gadgets like the PlayStation VR and relaunching Sony's robotic dog, Ibo. Hirai steps down as CEO in April, but he won't be leaving Sony. He'll be staying on as chairman of the company he helped rescue. Sharice Pham, CNN, Hong Kong. Well, you're watching The Living Markets here on the Swiss Pulse. Coming up, a rundown of the big stories from the world equities markets with yet more volatility for Bitcoin. Details up next. First, though, your weekend weather forecast. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland weekend weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. And the comfort indexes for some cities. Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. And we end with Sunday in Europe. discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. On our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. News programs are usually full of short stories that hardly go beneath the surface. We give you the big picture. Every weekday evening at 7 p.m., the big picture goes deeper, looking at an issue from different angles and bringing you the guests who take time to speak, explain, and elaborate. 
our viewers get a deeper understanding of the day's issues and the context that underlies them. The Big Picture, weekdays from 7 to 8 p.m. How do you make sure you're feeling good? We'll be focusing on all the tools available to us today to make sure we're physically and mentally healthy. From monitoring and avoiding disease to reactive and preventative health care. In particular, we'll be delving into the latest innovation coming out of Switzerland to ensure a long and healthy life. Feeling Good with Amanda Kane on CNN Money Switzerland. fashion, arts, and lifestyle. We've got it covered on Spotlight. Spotlight with Anna Maria Montero on CNN Money Switzerland. I've spent all of my career in the field, and I think that informs who I want to talk to, but more importantly, who wants to and who accepts to talk to me. And I hope that what I bring to the table is a rigorous search for the truth, and a rigorous determination and an effort to hold power accountable. Aman Paul. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, watch CNN Money Switzerland. Welcome back to The Living Markets. I'm Hannah Wise. This is the Swiss Pulse, and we're going to bring you bang up to date now with what's happening on the markets. And unfortunately, a little bit of fear has creeped back in for investors. They seem to be pulling their money out of stocks uh, this week in Switzerland while the SMI ended down in the red, down three quarters of a percentage share there. And the same goes for most of the other Swiss stocks this Friday, with a few exceptions. Let me just bring your attention to one company, Emplenia, Switzerland's leading group in the construction sector. They ended the day in the green, as you can see, up more than 3% today. And it's because the group said it had some pretty good operating performance results for the second half of last year. And it will pay a dividend comparable to the previous year. So investors happy, as you can see. And Plenty will publish its complete results uh, next month. So we'll have to keep an eye on that for you. But uh, just having a quick look over the other side of the world at Asia. The Nikkei 225 was down today, 0.9%, uh, amid concerns about the spike in US interest rates. Of course, uh, we've been talking about it here all week on the living markets. The Fed announcing earlier that it will increase interest rates this coming March. So things are going to start changing on the markets uh, around the world on that news. And staying just with Japan for a moment, because we mentioned it earlier, Sony. Uh, they're going to have a change of management come the 1st of April. Today, though, the electronics firm also ended in the green, up 1.86% after posting its highest ever operating profit for the last year's third quarter. One more big story to tell you about here on the market summary, and that is, of course, Bitcoin. The virtual currency plunged today, wrapping up its biggest weekly loss since December 2013. Now, this has all come about because there's a lot of concern about regulatory clampdown uh, around the world and a ban on adverts on Facebook pushing investors to sell. Back at home, with a look at the volatility SMI index, it's showing that uh, there has a, a little bit of volatility has come back in on the markets again. Investors are a little bit more uncertain about which way markets are going. As some say, 
there's an interesting correlation between the fall of Bitcoin price and volatility in general, where we're going to talk about Bitcoin a little bit later in the programme. But let's uh, focus on that volatility now here on the living markets and what's been happening this week. Joining me here in the studio is Stefan Gerlach, who's the chief economist at uh, EFG Bank. Thank you very much for coming in this Friday. I'm very happy to be here. So, stocks have taken a bit of a dive, especially in the United States at the beginning of this week. We've seen some recovery. I mean, what's, what's going on here? Are we starting to see the beginning of the end of all those record highs? Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, last year was very strong for, for stocks. January has been very strong uh, uh, for stocks. We had a, a bit of a sort of sell-off early this, uh, this week, and that led to a spike in, in volatility. But as the graph shows over there, this is nothing unusual. So I, I don't think this is the... Uh, so the fact worse. that the volatility is picking up there, it shouldn't spook investors, it, no, we shouldn't be concerned here. No, uh, volatility tends to fall in up markets and rise in down markets. And, and, and as you said, markets have sold, have sold off this week. So it's quite natural. I so think. we're probably looking a, a little bit too deeply into this because yes, you know, it's, so. been, it's been you know, so yes. low volatility in recent months that we've become a little complacent and a little bit of a move has... I think that's right. I mean, if you look at the broader global economy, it's growing very, very strongly. Strong growth uh, means strong earnings growth for firms and so on. It will support stock prices. So I think, uh, I think we shouldn't worry about this one. But what's happened this week has certainly spooked some investors. You know, the Fed announced that they're going to raise interest rates. I mean, we've known that for quite some time, yeah. so it really shouldn't have uh, much of a surprise, really. But things are changing. We've got Jerome Powell for example, he starts his new job tomorrow. That's quite right, yes. But he has been on the board of governors since uh, 2012. He's a known entity. Uh, he's been voting with Cherry Ellen for a number of years. So I think this is not uh, this is a new person, but it's not a change in US monetary policy. Uh, and interestingly, though, a lot of focus has been on him and will he change things up. But there are very many other positions to fill at the Fed, and that's what we should watch. Surely. I think that's quite right. There are, I think, uh, there are three open positions right now. Then uh, Chair Yellen is leaving next week, as we, as we know, so that's a fourth uh, position. And then William Dudley, the, uh, the head of the New York Fed, will be leaving, and that's another position to be, uh, to be filled. So with five positions out of 12 to be filled, depending on who's selected, this could make it for a change in US monetary policy. Is there anybody who could really kind of set the cat among the pigeons? No, I mean, there are 12 people voting on US monetary policy, so if you have one person who's really out in the left field or out in the right, right field, that won't change US monetary policy. But if you have a number of people people uh, going in one direction, for instance, for tighter monetary policy or for more expansion of monetary policy, that will have the margin impact on policy. The dollar is at its weakest point in yes. many, many years yes. at the moment. Yes. Um, some are suggesting that this could be purposefully driven by uh, Trump's uh, administration or the rhetoric coming from Trump's administration. Would you agree? I don't think so. I think when Trump was elected, there was this euphoria in, in markets. There would be tax reform would come. There would come a massive bout of infrastructure spending. Uh, there would be deregulation and so on and so forth. And, and the dollar strengthened very sharply. And then during the last year, we, I think uh, uh, President Trump has realized that governing a country is, is much harder than being uh, in a presidential campaign. And I think investors have, have realized that this is going to take much more, uh, much more time uh, than they first thought. So uh, people have possibly banded around, you know, this so-called currency war. You don't think this no. kind of thing is on the cards at no, all? No, no, not at all, not at all. Not in the near future or the No, I think the this whole idea future. of currency war is generally sort of over, uh, overdone, I think. Uh, um, exchange rates moves because of what happens in, in markets. And I think people felt, as I said, that, that things would happen very quickly when he was elected. And they realized it's a slow process. Uh, and they sort of, you know, uh, uh, pull back a little bit. Any other bumps in the road this year, do you think? This coming year here? Well, mm -hmm. there are lots of things being, being happening. I mean, if you, if you want to, some scare scenarios, we can think of many. We can think of North <laughs> Korea, negotiations about Brexit. Maybe uh, some realistic uh, ones. <laughs> um, I think one issue is uh, whether the world economy is picking up too strongly. So the IMF raised its, its global forecast mm -hmm. quite sharply. Um, 
And uh, there is always the risk that this will feed on to inflation. We, we could have an inflation shock. We, we don't anticipate that, but it, we, we could have an inflation shock. And then there is a, a possibility that central banks will say, oops, we are a little bit behind the curve, and they might then tighten monetary policy, and that would surprise investors. Investors have sort of priced in a very benign scenario, strong growth, continued low inflation, a gradual increase in, in policy. But if that didn't happen, uh, things could get a little, a little rockier, I think. But you don't foresee a market, a stock market crash or anything? No, I don't, I don't think so. You seem very positive. Yeah, I mean, the, the world economy is growing very, very strongly. And um, the world economy is in a much better place now than it was 2008. In 2008, everyone knew that there were risks in the financial system. Uh, and uh, everyone knew that there were sort of lacking institutions within Europe to deal with the uh, euro area risks and so on and so forth. But, but now, uh, regulators, government, central banks have had uh, 10 years to, to deal with some of these risks and, and, and to strengthen the system. And they've done so. So I think we're in a much better place now than we were 10 years ago. And here in Switzerland, do you think the SMB will start uh, raising interest rates? Well, that is the interesting question. As you know, monetary policy in Switzerland is extremely expansionary. Rates are minus. 75 basis yep. points uh, uh, in the euro area. The ECB's deposit rate is at minus 40. There's quite a margin there. If uh, inflation picks up in, in, uh, in the euro area during the spring, then mm -hmm. I think investors will start to anticipate higher interest rates in, in the euro area. And that will generate a bit of a, of a leeway for the SMB to tighten monetary policy marginally. And I suspect they'd be very keen to do that. There's been a lot of commentary on Swiss monetary policy, also in the US, as mm -hmm. you know. And I, I think if, the, if, if, there was, if they could do so uh, without uh, triggering an, another bout of appreciation of the Swiss franc, I suspect that they would be keen to do that. Stefan Gerlach, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Well, you are watching The Living Markets. And this Friday, we are wrapping up what could be the worst week for Bitcoin since 2013. Cryptocurrencies pretty much across the board have plunged, some as much as 20%. Now, Bitcoin, as we showed you earlier, is uh, not sitting too pretty today. And remember, just a few weeks ago, we were seeing record highs uh, across the board. In a moment, we'll be finding out a bit more about what's going on. But first, CNN Tech's Jose Paglieri explains just how to buy and sell it. You've probably heard a lot about Bitcoin that digital currency that everyone suddenly wants to get in on, mostly because the price has been skyrocketing. But it's not new. It's been around since 2009. I wrote a book about it in 2014, and I even tried to survive on Bitcoin in New York City for 24 hours. That was pretty easy. That $20 bill you just saw me put into that Bitcoin ATM machine, it's worth like 900 bucks today. Sounds like a pretty good investment. I'd like a beef and lamb shawarma and a bottle of water. 9.34. Okay, send payment. And I assure you, that ended up being the most expensive lunch I've ever had. That $9 shawarma is now worth 420 bucks in today's dollars. But depending on the day this week, it could be worth $390, $500. And that's the thing. It shows just how volatile Bitcoin is. But if you really want to purchase some of it, this is how you do it. The process is pretty easy. If you download the Coinbase app here, you can go in and set up an account. You can choose between your bank account or a debit card, and the debit card is much faster and a lot easier. Now here's the tricky part. You're gonna need to verify these transactions. So you now need to log into your bank account to see if it actually went through. All right, the last two transactions, 139 and 149. That's it, done. Now let's actually purchase a piece of a Bitcoin because right now it's trading at something like, ooh, $16,000. I'm not gonna empty out my account right away. $20 worth comes out to 0 0.001. That's like one one thousandth of a Bitcoin. That's how much 20 bucks will get you nowadays. And it's successful. We've now purchased one one thousandth of a Bitcoin. Another way to get into this is through the stock market with Bitcoin futures. That is, speculating on what you think the price will be. And if you're one of those who thinks that this is all just a giant speculative bubble, you can actually bet the price will go down. And now, to sell your Bitcoin. You hit sell. I want to sell the fraction of a Bitcoin. And here we go. Confirm sell. 
Now let's say you actually really want to hold on to some of this. Here's the thing, what do you own exactly? What is that value behind Bitcoin? Don't kid yourself, this is not a traditional investment. Stocks, a stock represents ownership of part of a company, and companies have property, labor, machines. The reason that Bitcoin is worth so much right now is because someone else is willing to pay more for it than you are. That's the definition of speculation. It's not investing, that's gambling. Well, joining me now is blockchain expert Jan Brzezek, CEO and co-founder at Crypto Finance. Thank you for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. So what's going on here? Why this big slump this week? I would say there are mainly three reasons. One is it was an unbelievable increase in December, October, November, December. Yes. So uh, what goes up that quickly has to come down sooner or later and normally. Then uh, there were some regulatory uncertainties. And the third one, which is an important part of all, is the whole psychology, right? Those are mainly retail investors and they are afraid now to lose more money, mm -hmm. so they sell and then just gets a downward spiral. We were hearing earlier that some people believe there's a pretty strong correlation between volatility, which we're starting to see pick up a little bit in markets in general, and Bitcoin price. Would you agree with that? Um, uh, so far, we saw a negative correlation or an uncorrelated uh, asset at Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, it, it has some relations. And I think people are using Bitcoin as an alternative to traditional assets, yes. Let's focus on the regulation then. Mm -hmm. The list of those opting out is increasing. We heard India most recently. They're trying to ban. Uh, cryptocurrencies, South Korea, China, who do you think's next? Do you think that this is becoming um, a, a No, bigger... I, I'm slightly disagreeing. What we see is that there are still many uncertainties. Um, some people are making announcements, but then they got revised again afterwards. So we don't see South Korea or India banning cryptos. I would say they're imposing stricter regulations on it, which is a good thing, right? We need uh, clarity, we need certainty, what is cryptos and how they have so you, to behave. So you want more regulation, you're yes, pro obviously, regulation. Yes, obviously, no, no, absolutely. I mean, Isn't that the, just the just complete opposite asset. of what a cryptocurrency is though? It's kind of, that, that's the beauty of it, that's what appeals it's, to people. Um, maybe, you know, the, the original idea was to have a currency, a peer-to-peer -peer payment system without an intermediary, but it doesn't mean without any regulation. So it should have a regulation, a regulation or a regulatory framework is a good thing. And we really ask for more regulation because this gives more uh, rules and certainty that more investors as well, institutional investors, for example, go in that space. So more regulation could promote the use yes. of a cryptocurrency, for yeah. example. And I'm interested to see how we could use uh, cryptocurrencies in the future. I mean, we just saw a report by CNN about trying to actually use it in everyday life. And it's not that easy. I see it as an, as an, something, an investment tool, not as something that I can pay my shopping with. Will it ever get to that stage? Yeah, I think so. But that's very important as well, that not all cryptos are cryptocurrencies. Okay. Some have some currency functionality, some payment functionality, but some others are more a store of value, which, for example, Bitcoin, in my opinion, is more a store of value, is limited by the number of uh, existing Bitcoins. Um, but there are some platforms as well. Now, tokens uh, have been issued, which are more security because it uh, is directly linked to the success of a company. And there are several other... So I. I see it rather more like a crypto asset, or that's a new asset class, and then you need to look into each crypto, what it is exactly. I think that's very important that you define or that you dig a little bit more into it. Do you think central banks will become more involved in uh, cryptocurrency in the future? Do uh, you see that happening soon? Yeah, I mean, basically it's blockchain. Blockchain is a very inter interesting technology, and Cryptos are just the token on the blockchain and you need to have something like that. And it's not a problem to issue a Swiss franc token, a crypto franc or a crypto dollar. I mean, UBS is working on such a project, as you probably know. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, we have seen the statement or her speech, the speech from Christine Lagarde at the Bank of England conference or at the annual uh, meeting of the IMF where she said that cryptos are potentially a good opportunity for some weaker central banks or governments to increase the trust in their institutions. It's interesting you say that. We, we were talking to Oswald Grubel, who's the former Credit Suisse and UBS CEO, and he told us here on uh, the Swiss Pulse that actually Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, well, they're just not for Swiss investors. Take a listen to what he had to say. But coming back on Bitcoin, uh, why I think it probably will be longer here, the main reason is not that we buy Bitcoin. For us, Bitcoin is because we live in a safe country. We, <clears throat> we can use our own currency and our own currency is safe. So we have no need to buy Bitcoin. And if you live in a country where either the government takes the money from you or devalues the, the currency so fast that nothing is left for you, you look for other ways. Well, that was Oswald Grubel talking to my colleague Amanda Kane earlier uh, this week. Um, do you agree with what he says that you know? <laughs> no, absolutely. If you see Bitcoin as a currency, mm -hmm. then we don't need it in Switzerland. Uh, we have credit cards. We have Twint, for example. We can send money to each other uh, very easily. And so how can Switzerland lead the way then? We're touting ourselves as Crypto Valley, the crypto, cal uh, you know, the, 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 the capital, I guess, yeah. of uh, cryptocurrencies and, and, bit and, and blockchain. How can we take it to the next level? It's, again, it's about regulation. Putting the ground uh, basis, a foundation for cryptos and applications on the blockchain. I think that's where Switzerland can lead. And what are you hoping from FINMA this month? They're, they have been thinking about regulation. What are you hoping that they come out with? <laughs> um, we're currently in the process to launch a fund, an index fund um, for cryptos. And we hope that they uh, approve it and they lay out a good foundation for further development. But it, it's a new technology, right? So for them, it's as well a, a risk um, everyone else is talking negatively or many others are talking negatively about cryptos and if Switzerland comes up now with a positive statement it might give some pressure on Switzerland. Oh, well, we'll wait with interest to hear what they have to say. Jan Bredek, thank you very much indeed for thank coming in. Thank you very in. much. Well, you are watching The Living Markets here on the Swiss Pulse, and there's lots uh, still to come. Sports tonight, for example, after the break, we'll have the latest on the Swiss Olympic team. We've already started arriving in Pyeongchang. Also, the business of the Super Bowl. One big game this weekend and one massive price tag too. That's next after the break. Since the founding of the Red Cross in 1863, the city of Geneva has a long tradition of hosting international organizations. In our program, International Geneva, we'll be exploring issues of international cooperation, humanitarian assistance and human rights, and talk to international players about the challenges and solutions to global problems. International Geneva, with Martina Fuchs on CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV, on our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. The best Swiss business news whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. How do you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation. Business opportunities anywhere. What drives the Swiss business world? What makes the economy tick? And how do companies react to the ever-changing challenges of the markets? 
We've got our finger on the Swiss pulse. We'll bring you the ups and downs, bulls and bears of the world of business, always asking what it means for you. The Swiss pulse, weekdays from 6 to 9 p.m. Business is always changing. Keep up with CNN Money. Maggie Lake is live in the heart of the world's economic epicenter, New York City, tracking all the action of the stock exchanges and the big business stories from around the world. Get top analysis of market movements and a daily breakdown of financial headlines. CNN Money with Maggie Lake. At the end of the business day, we're only just getting started. On the living markets from 6 to 7 p.m., we crunch the numbers on the financial markets, bring you the top analysis of the day, and set the agenda for tomorrow. Always with Switzerland important global links in mind. The Living Markets, weeknights from 6 to 7 p.m., only on CNN Money Switzerland. Welcome back to the Living Markets here on the Swiss Pulse. Now, it's just one week to go until the biggest ever Winter Olympic Games gets underway. South Korean residents have been waiting for this moment for almost seven years. Their towns have been transformed, travel links have brought them closer to the capital city, and international tourists are closer to Pyeongchang. Excitement is high, and hopes for the region after the athletes go home are strong. CNN's Paula Hancock reports. There's a lot to toast in Pyeongchang these days. This group of friends is making the most of the local cuisine and a splash of the local liquor. Barbecue and soju, two Korean specialities that will be in abundant supply for the month of February. Uh, for us, as a restaurant, it's a, a fantastic opportunity to introduce uh, Korean barbecue to the world. So it is very meaningful. Nick Gasson travelled from New Zealand to help the Olympics preparations. His company makes artificial snow. Uh, natural snow, there isn't much, but what we've been able to make has been really amazing. Everywhere you look, snowmaking machines are working overtime. The one thing the organisers cannot control, the weather. They're hoping the Games put Pyeongchang on the map encouraging a winter pilgrimage to South Korea in years to come. Probably one of the biggest boosts to this region after the Olympics is over is this, the KTX, the fast train that runs from Seoul to Gangnam on the east coast of the country where many of the Olympic venues are in less than two hours. It usually takes around three hours if you're driving, but to be fair, the traffic means it usually takes a lot longer. Those in the Pyeongchang region feel far closer to the capital now. Improvements in infrastructure many think wouldn't have happened without the Games. South Korea says this will be the biggest Olympics in history, with more athletes than ever before. Even some from the northern neighbour, who they're still technically at war with. A united women's ice hockey team with players from both North and South Korea. Suggesting President Moon Jae-in's early claim that this would be the Peace Olympics may not be as implausible as critics once thought. For residents themselves, the Games have been good for business before they even start. Paula Hancock's CNN, Pyeongchang, South Korea. Well, my colleague Martina Fuchs caught up with our sports correspondent Matt Layton earlier for more on the Swiss Olympic team. Now, getting money and funding is a big issue for many athletes. Uh, and to talk about this issue now is our very own sports correspondent, Matt Layton. Hello. So, Matt, how does the funding actually work here in Switzerland? Switzerland's history is that culture and sport are a private matter. So that's good and it's bad. It's good in the way that athletes can approach pretty much anyone and they might have an open ear because they're sensitive to the offer, they know that athletes have challenges. We're not talking about Roger Federer, we're talking about the average 90% of athletes representing Switzerland in a variety of different sports. Centralised, Swiss Olympic, Sports Aid, they do give money to Swiss athletes. 
and that is on how much you deserve it in the view of are you a good medal potential at a World Championships or an Olympics? Say they have a different card system. Gold card, clearly you are a medalist hope and you get X. I can't tell you the exact figure because there is quite a large band. Silver and then bronze. So that's the, the state. Another really, really good way that the biathletes, a lot of cross-country athletes do, is they are member of the army. Again, they do a certain amount of days, but they have to be good and they get funding as well. Another is through crowdfunding. Crowdfunding with social media, you can either go on your own Facebook site and say, I deserve this, please pay me, or you go to Switzerland as a really good example called I Believe in You, which has many, many athletes, and they have corporate sponsors, and they give the athletes money for deserving projects. You have a project, you make a video, and you say, I need... 15,000 Swiss francs to employ a coach. The corporates come in and they pay it. So also, it does unfortunately come down to money, a mummy and daddy, part-time jobs. But now, 2018, you need to be full-time to be good at anything. So it's a real challenge. But surely the cash is not enough. What other sources of financing are there, especially for the winter athletes? The winter athletes, they do, depending, if you're a downhill successful skier, then clearly you get central funding. And so it is a case of, it's almost a survival of the fittest in some cases, because there's a lot of injuries, you have to have personal insurance, which luckily in Switzerland is very good, but it's mainly a case of surviving your few years. If you get good results, clearly you are attracting big sponsors, which really can change the whole ball game. So Lara Gut, a prodigy as a child, speaks four languages, very good on social media, so she attracts the big sponsors. So it is really, it's a survival of the fittest. The best athletes in all these respects gets the most money, but for the other athletes, it can be extremely, extremely hard, and a lot of them live on the breadline, pretty much. For example, the summer sports yeah. athletes, right? They practice in summer, they make their money, and they're living in summertime, but what do they do in winter? Well, if you take an example of maybe the canoe athletes, Switzerland has a good level. Two of them are flying today to Australia for winter training. So you have a Thomas Cochran, who's a European medalist in the canoe, and then you have Martin Dugut, who's a champion also in the kayak. They have to pretty much beg for money. They're in the Geneva region, so they get some small local funding through Sport Aid as well, but they have... Martin works about 15 hours a week, Tom does all sorts of things, and he says a season costs him about 50,000 Swiss. When they're going down to Australia for two or three weeks, it'll cost him about 3,500 Swiss. So they're pretty much on the breadline, because in those sports, they're very noble, but there's no real prize money. So it's, it's trying to get their website up and trying to almost appeal to the kindness of people to give them money. But it's, it's certainly difficult. Thank you very much for your time, Matt, and shedding light on this uh, very important issue of money in the world of sports. Thank you. Well, we're going to stay with uh, sport now. America is just days away from the biggest event in its sporting calendar, the Super Bowl, where the Philadelphia Eagles will take on reigning champions, the New England Patriots. But never mind the football, there are some viewers who are just as excited by what happens at halftime. Game of Thrones star Peter Dinklage channeling his inner Buster Rhymes. Quiet! Hush your mouth. And Morgan Freeman getting his freak on, promoting Doritos and Mountain Dew. Their lip sync battle of sorts is a teaser for one of the high priced ads to come on America's most watched sporting event of the year Super Bowl Sunday. Most brands are holding off the big surprises for Super Bowl Sunday, but star-studded mini-previews create almost as much buzz as the game itself. <laughs> Alexa? Amazon's Alexa lost her voice this morning. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos revealed that the company's digital assistant device is getting a new voice. The ad shows executives scrambling to replace Alexa's lost voice with hilarious alternatives. Alexa, show me a recipe for a grilled cheese sandwich. Pathetic. You're 32 years of age and you don't know how to make a grilled cheese sandwich. It's Amazon is paying millions for the ad space and they're just one of many big spenders. Michelob Ultra. Lower, lower. Michelob Ultra. 
Actor Chris Pratt is headlining the spot for low-calorie brew Michelob Ultra. Sometimes I wish I were human. Whoa! Look at me! I'm human! M&M's hired Danny DeVito to depict their signature chocolate candy. Man, I look good. You're still short and bald. Budweiser's ad tugs at the heartstrings. Stand by me. Promoting the company's efforts to send water to areas hard hit by natural disasters in the U.S. While the tones may differ, most will likely stay far away from anything that could lead to controversy. This year, for the last, first time, I think people are backing off political, kind of like, you know, social, social cause related kind of stuff. The, the election in the last year or so, people are ready to pounce on commercials and, and say, I don't like that. That's not for me. That's offensive. While they'll have to tread a careful line between charming and politically charged, the big brands spend big on Super Bowl Sunday for one reason. If it's anything like last year, more than 100 million people will be watching. Maggie Lake, CNN. Well, our resident American, sorry, <laughs> and general party goer, yeah. Anna Marie Montero joins me in the studio now, and you're getting us in this uh, in this Super Bowl spirit here. I see. I am. You cannot have. You can't even talk about the Super Bowl without having some Super Bowl food. Nachos, these are a little lame looking because there's nothing on them. Usually you would have some cheese and some, or some chicken or, you know, something else on them to make them a little more exciting. But we've got some salsa and we're going to go with that. Okay, great. Well, we're going to tuck into that in a minute. But just quickly explain to us who's playing this weekend. What can we expect? Well, it's the biggest, you know, it's the most watched sport event of the year. And this, as you said earlier, the New England Patriots are going to be battling it out with the Philadelphia Eagles. It's all about Tom Brady. This is his eighth Super Bowl. He's the quarterback. Okay. <laughs> That's all you need to know. And, and he's, he's married and to he, Giselle Blanchett. But he is, plays for the Patriots. He plays for the Patriots, absolutely. Okay. So and, they are defending. And so everyone watches this. You know, this is like yes. America's biggest over turn 100 on, apart million. from the State of the Union. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Maybe <so>. even more. <laughs> 100 million uh, people, more or less, in the U.S. will watch this every year. Mm -hmm. But if you look at around the world where people also watch it, believe it or not, you're looking at numbers that go from 160 to 180. Wow. Million people to 189, excuse me, million people in over 180 countries. And we can actually catch it this year because it's at a reasonable time. It is. <laughs> it's just after midnight. If that's what you're into and you have the energy for it, <laughs> the next day might be a little rough. But yes, about midnight. Okay. We just saw the, this whole thing about the adverts in, in the halftime. And yes. this is mega business. Massive. These are not, you know, tin pot productions. These are mega bucks. No. Mega bucks. And they're paying five, the companies are paying $5 million for 30 seconds of airtime. Uh, and how many minutes of airtime is available? I mean, there's several adverts, or is it just a handful? No, there's a there are several scheduled ad breaks, but okay. you know, you're looking at an average. So there was a leakage already of the ads mm -hmm. that were run in the Super Bowl, and you were looking at an, at least 25. Okay, so, so 25 different companies all paying yes, something like at least. five five million. Okay, um, famous Super Bowl advertisements um, come from the kind of rich and famous. Yes, a lot of celebrities take part in these advertisements, which makes them even more expensive. You're paying $5 million for the airtime, and then you're paying for the celebrities to also take part. They're like little movies. Okay. So, you know, this year we saw in package earlier, we saw Peter Dinklage, and we saw, yeah. you know, Morgan Freeman you know, doing and, commercials. And, and these guys aren't the only ones, these advertisers aren't the only ones who are kind of, you know, spending the big bucks yeah. or making big bucks out of this. The also, local bars and restaurants, bars, and, you absolutely. know, this is a massive social occasion. I mean, what are we looking at there, business-wise? Absolutely. It's also so a, a mega business here, uh, anywhere where you watch it, but you know, even in Europe, as well, much as in the US. Well, you've already spent money on our nachos, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also contributing to the economy of the Super it. Bowl from Switzerland. In the game. They do, they do. It's okay. also uh, a situ a, you know, an occasion for betters to really pull it out and prevent. So and, and people. Up to four, $4.76 billion in the US of betting. What? Well, but most of it, we're talking 97% more or less, it's gonna be whoosh, okay. under the table. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And if we wanted to watch it here in Switzerland, and I can't see why we wouldn't, when can we? After midnight, baby. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Anna Maria Montero. Thank you. <laughs> OK, next up tonight on The Living Market, a little bit of comedy from our new CNN Money Switzerland programme, Spotlight. In this edition, Martina Fuchs talks to one of Switzerland's most celebrated comedians and cabaret stars, who was out to prove how funny Swiss people can really be. Hello and welcome to Spotlight, the show that brings you all the latest buzz from the world of music, entertainment, fashion, culture and lifestyle. 
When you think of Switzerland, the usual stereotypes come to mind. Chocolates, mountains, cows, cheese. But the Swiss are rarely associated with humor. One man, however, is trying to change all that. In fact, he's having quite a lot of success as his tour, just for fun, has been extended for a second year. Welcome to the show, Marco Rima. Hi, nice to be here. So, you have been on the road constantly over the past uh, two years. Are you not feeling tired? Uh, no, no, not really. At the moment, I feel a little bit tired because I'm, I'm working on two projects. First of all, I am on tour with my, my show, with my program, Just For Fun. And second, I have to finish a work uh, I've done uh, last summer. I was on a road by bike, two and a half thousand kilometers through six countries. And now we do kind of a, a comedy uh, documentary for the Swiss television and I have to edit everything. And so I'm flying uh, always to Cologne and do the, the work there till uh, in, the, in, the, in the morning. The final date for your tour, just for fun, is set for December the 14th. Any plans to extend the tour beyond that date once more? You no, know, I don't want to play my old uh, show with my musicians, but it would be maybe exciting to to tell how how I was how my life was and uh, why I became a comedian and uh, then I'm playing some old numbers. Maybe the people would like it. And then the show was so uh, um, so. F made so much fun that my wife said, hey, you have to go on tour because people love it when you're telling about the, the past. And so I was now, or I'm still on tour, but then we want to go to Australia. We want to make a break and uh, live maybe for a half year in Brisbane and just enjoy life. You would definitely deserve some time off. So you mentioned uh, your origins uh, as a comedian. Why did you become a comedian? Well, when I was nine years old, I, I, I grew up with Emil Steinberg, Cesar Kaiser, with uh, Jerry Lewis, all these uh, great comedians. And uh, it was always my dream to become a, a comedian. And uh, well, I started very early. I, I, first of all, you're, you're, you, you, you play your, your heroes at school. That's why I had to repeat uh, the sixth uh, grade uh, again, because they liked me so much. And uh, yeah, it was clear. But before I, I, I became a comedian, my father said, learn something real and then you can do whatever you like. And I became a teacher, you know. And then teaching comedy to the audience of yeah. Switzerland, because the Swiss people really are not considered very funny. You know, they are more controlled and uh, really, um, you know, very serious. Mm. Uh, how do you entertain the Swiss people? When you're talking about life, if you're telling stories about life, you know, what happened in life, I mean, People ask me always, where do you get your ideas? You just have to open your eyes, your ears, your, your, your senses. I was once uh, invited to a show in, in, in Germany um, and they said, we, we, get, we pick you up uh, with a helicopter. The problem was I was drinking a lot of tea during a show because I had a problem with my voice. And then I jumped in this helicopter and this helicopter just started and it was like, <laughs> and oh shit, I have to pee. And uh, you know, there's a flight of 50 minutes and it's all and you think, I'm, I'm going to die. And in the end, I really had to pee in the Kulturbeutel, Nécessaire, and Ness in the air. So um, it's, it's a, a, a true story, but then you tell this story again and everybody had a s kind of a same, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, same story in his life so they can laugh. We and, can all relate to uh, yeah, certain that's issues. I'm, I'm, t I'm telling stories about life and people can laugh. So there is no difference between uh, Switzerland, America, China, where, wherever. People likes to laugh or, or to cry, whatever. We're all human beings at the end yes. of the day. There are even laughter classes in India, for example, to really? make people uh, laugh. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, Maybe really good. that's I the like. next uh, <laughs> destination for you. Absolutely. So Just For Fun has been very successful. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what makes great comedy? What are some of the most important ingredients? I guess you have to be honest. And uh, whatever you are telling the people, you have to be honest in the way that they believe it. And uh, this is the most important. And you have to like it, you know? I, I, I don't need a motivation to go on stage because there are a thousand people waiting and, and they, they, they want to laugh. 
And this is so much motivation, it's so much fun. And after a show, I go home and I'm happy. And my life, it makes my life as well so easy. So uh, I'm very privileged that I, I, I can do this profession and it's not a job, it's a profession, you know. That's it, it's your passion, uh, passion and yeah. brings you some nice cash as mm -hmm. well. So in Just for Fun, the sequences are called Wilhelm Tell, we have uh, Pillerly and Zapferly, mm -hmm. Foti for Gäste, mm -hmm. real Swiss German uh, terms. <laughs> what is your key message? In the end, Try to be, try to be easy. Go, go out and and laugh. This, that smile. This is the best what you can do. This is sometimes a hope I have. If politicians would come together and uh, uh, shake hands and give each other a smile and ask first, how how are you? How is your life? Uh, or I heard there's a problem with your, your wife, she's sick, is everything fine? Then it's kind of a, you know, human beings are coming together. And I'm sure the world will, would become better. And that's my, my, my uh, that's what I want to do. Tell the people, hey, go out, laugh. And if, if, if you have a, 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 a heavy period, just try to, 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 uh, to, to find a way out with, a sense of humor. Actually, just before the show, you mentioned to me that talking about shaking hands, you also met Donald Trump, yes. the US president. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this encounter. Was it funny? Well, it was interesting, you know. I mean, I was invited because of friends of mine. They have a condo in uh, uh, Palm Beach uh, in Miralago, where Donald Trump is sat, uh, settled. And so it was interesting because for me, at that time, he was a tycoon, you know. And uh, well, he was not the president of the United States of America, so there was no fake news, nothing wrong, nothing like that. No, it was, it was funny for me. It's a tough uh, subject, yeah. right? He's sometimes Donald a great Trump. comedian. But I think we have to be care careful, you know. I, he's not my type. As well, Putin is not my type. But um, it's, uh, sometimes we have to be... I mean, we have to concentrate on our politics, so I don't want to talk too much about the states, you know, so... Well, Marco, let's take a look at the US. Actually, some of the best comedy and satire in the world has to do with politics. And the US uh, is probably the best example right now. Let's take a look at how some of the top political comedians there got into the business. I cannot believe the men and women that we have chosen to be our leaders. You watch the in-house footage of these congressional hearings, and I think, what sort of empty-headed Pez dispenser seance am I watching here? Politics is one of the most egregiously hypocritical areas of society, and thus great fodder for comedy. In the White House, in the Oval Office, on the wall, Obama has the original copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, yeah, which I'm pretty sure is just there in case the Tea Party's like, we don't think you're free. All right, look at the wall. Politicians are so loathsome, but we're stuck with them. We can't prosecute all of them, so let's at least mock them. I believe if you can't say something nice about somebody, you must be talking about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Donald Trump, oh my God. Donald Trump is like the nagging cough that has turned into full-blown age. You know what I'm saying? I think every political comedian feels their role is different. It's very clear now that we have political comedians who are actually acting as advocates and also really feel like it's important to speak truth to power. I ended up doing political comedy because when I'm angry, I'm, I'm funny. That just seems to be the deal. And politicians make me really angry. Democrats and Republicans believe that what they tell you about the fact is actually the fact itself. And it isn't a f fact! We don't have anything to lose. We don't have to worry that the White House isn't going to give us access. We already don't have access, so we can say whatever we want. So, Marco, the Swiss people, they have a reputation of always being controlled and very serious. What gets them to burst out laughing? What I really enjoy is they can laugh about themselves. So if I perform like a farmer who is, uh, like, yeah, who had a verrichter, I was auch, I was verrichter, <laughs> then... Uh, that then they laugh, you know, and they like it. And uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, things 
who makes us, we are not the founder of uh, comedy or, or humor, but f friendly people. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun to perform in Switzerland, first of all, because they just enjoy it and they're relaxed. And they have a sense for uh, different languages because we, ra we raise up with uh, four languages and you feel that, that's cool. And you can also imitate a lot of different dialects, isn't it? How yeah. difficult has it been to learn all of them because there are so many in Switzerland? Well, of course, when I do the Basel dialect or uh, Bern, the people from Bern, they recognize, of course, that it's not proper, but you have to do it in a way like if I would do an... Can you give me an example for Bern, for example? Yeah, it's it's slower, you know. And the Basel is then on the point very, But you speak excellent English well, as well on top of that. Could you actually consider to take your show just for fun outside of Switzerland as well, to the English-speaking mm -hmm. world or Germany? Or do you think there would be maybe also a cultural mm -hmm. barrier where people would not understand your sense of humor? Well, uh, Germany, I, I, uh, I'm on tour in Germany as well. And, and I did a lot of, I did a news show in Germany, you know, the Wochen show. Uh, so it was uh, not the nine o'clock news. We were four comedians and every Saturday, like Saturday night, we did a, a comedy show. So I was on tour in Germany as well. And uh, of course, it would be interesting to do my stuff as well in English. And one of my best friends, Rob Spence, is an Australian uh, comedian. Uh, we, uh, we already had a chat that we said, uh, let's, let's work on it and, and have a look how, how it worked it out. You founded the Cabaret Marco Cello together with Marcel Weber back in 1980 and you won several awards including the Prix Valo, which is kind of the Swiss Oscar for the best comedian in Switzerland. How important is it for a comedian in Switzerland to win such prizes and awards? That time it was amazing, you know, we were a young, a young couple and... Um, that was surprising because it was really a, a prize of the audience. I mean, people voted and that time you didn't have uh, internet or whatever. It was really like they had to, uh, to write a, a letter and to send it. So everybody was surprised that we got the, the award. So it was wonderful that we got the prize. And I, I enjoyed always getting a prize. Uh, I, I would hang it around my neck if I could. You are very successful in Switzerland, mm. one of uh, the most successful comedians. So how difficult is it to make a living as a comedian and actor here in Switzerland? This is very difficult. I mean, there are only two percentage of the actors and comedians, and um, actors who can uh, live uh, of their profession, two percentage. And the comedian, maybe it's easier because you uh, entertain people. But I think uh, like Stefan Büster and, and Wela and all these guys, they go around, you know, with uh, comedy shows and they're all together. And um, I give sometimes people like them uh, as well uh, uh, the, the possibility to, to, to perform before I do my show. So a thousand people see them and you have to help each other. And uh, you never know, uh, may maybe this is the American style. I tell myself, you know, sometimes maybe you go, if you're going down, you're very happy if you help somebody going up. And then when you have the, 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 the situation going down, I can, hey, could you help me? And so I'm very uh, much, uh, we, we should help each other. But uh, the material, I mean, the people are great. We have great women as well, mm -hmm. women. Thank moment. you very much for mentioning the women. Now, you had a lot of solo performances. For mm -hmm. example, Think Positive, No Limits, Time Out. And you also wrote and staged, for example, the musical Keep Cool, mm -hmm. which was uh, tremendously successful. Where do you see your own professional future? Of course, I have some dreams and I always lift my dreams. I never was just dreaming. So... Um, I, I, I would like to perform again uh, Hank Hoover. This was one of my favorite uh, musical comedy I did. And uh, then I see myself as well in the second, do you say role, second position? Yes, absolutely. M more producing, you know, or more helping other uh, new talents to, to get up. Because I'm now 56, I'm, well, a dinosaur in my, in my profession. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Marco Rima, it was really a fun time here with you today. And thank you very much uh, for watching this edition of Spotlight. See you next time. Well, that wraps up the living markets. Up next, it's the big picture with Martina Fuchs. Let's talk tech. Do you want to see the latest gadgets? Understand where robotics will take us next? Find out more about the pioneers and their latest research? Join us on Tech Talk, where we'll be meeting the people behind the big ideas here in Switzerland and around the world and finding out what it means for businesses, consumers, and the planet. Tech Talk with Anna Maria Montero on CNN Money Switzerland. Money is more than just currency. It is the fuel for how we live our lives. It connects us. It drives us. It buys us things. But it is more than that. It is who we are and what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Money isn't everything, but it is everywhere, and so are we. We are younger, we are richer, and we are smarter. We are money. CNN Money. the world with Becky Anderson. It all starts here. Changing, fighting, creating, connecting. That's why we're here. We live here, we work here, we're from here. And we'll go wherever the story takes us. I'm Becky Anderson in Tehran. We are in Jerusalem. Real news that shapes our world. Exploring not just what's going on, but why. I just want to press you on one further point. Getting perspective on this region from this region. Places that many of us know, but few of us get to see. Observing countries on the move, still rooted in tradition. It all starts here, and that's why we're here, bringing you the world from our Middle Eastern hub. Connect the world with Becky Anderson. The clock for Brexit, it is ticking. The divorce date is set for March the 29th, 2019. But many other key issues are still on the table as calls for Switzerland to nail down its relationship with the UK grow. The head of foreign trade at Economy Suisse warns Switzerland must act sooner rather than later. We have quite a clear picture where problems might arise. Then we bring this to our governments and tell them, listen, this is your work now. Make sure that there's no gap and that business can continue as it does today. So I'm quite optimistic that this communication work is working, but the outcome at the end right now is not fully guaranteed. Creating a new generation of coders, the CEO of the Swiss-based Kudelski Group thinks more children should learn how to program software. Andre Kudelski talks to us in our Newsmaker Hour about the importance of unlocking our digital potential. Fundamentally, there is a lack of uh, uh, urgency sense regarding the digitalization in Europe and Switzerland in particular. And here I think it will take some time, but it's really important once more when Switzerland is sitting in the driver's seat. 
And also this hour, keeping the world's most iconic buildings in shape, we go behind the scenes. Welcome to the Big Picture, I am Martina Fuchs. Let's take a look now at some of the news making headlines here in Switzerland and around the world. Just last week, its aircraft were protecting airspace above the World Economic Forum in Davos. But for the last two days, five of the Swiss Air Force's FA-18 Hornets have been grounded after investigators found cracks in the landing gear. In December, the Swiss government announced plans to spend 8 billion Swiss francs on new fighter jets. That after voters rejected a 3.1 billion Swiss francs order for jets in May 2014. Several Swiss banks are refusing to transfer assets belonging to Saudi clients detained during a recent crackdown on corruption. That's according to a report in Geneva newspaper Le Temps. Earlier reports had said the new Saudi regime under Mohammed bin Salman had pressured clients to repatriate funds from Swiss accounts. The Geneva paper cited sources saying Riyadh planned to confiscate the assets. UBS, Piquet, Lombard, Odier and Credit Suisse are among the banks mentioned in the report. An upward revision of economic growth in Germany could help Chancellor Angela Merkel hammer out a coalition deal with the country's social democrats. The government raised its forecast by half of a percent after positive economic data pointed to added tax revenues. Talks on ending over four months of political limbo are likely to stretch into the next week. However, despite agreements on education, migration and pensions are still there. Good news this Friday coming from South Africa after nearly 1,000 gold miners trapped underground were finally rescued. The workers at the Sibanye Stillwater mine were trapped last Wednesday after power failure prevented elevators from bringing them to the surface. Safety at mines in South Africa has been an ongoing issue with some 80 recorded fatalities last year. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has announced an ambitious plan to give hundreds of thousands of poor and vulnerable families free health care. The plan dubbed Modi Care, almost like Obamacare, would cover hospital costs of up to half a million rupees every year, which translates into around 7,800 US dollars. That's more than 15 times the amount poor families can currently claim from the government. Access to health care is a major problem in India, but if the program gets the go-ahead, it could cost $780 billion, which is a huge part of the country's 2.4 trillion economy. The CEO of Japanese conglomerate Sony is stepping down. After six years at the helm, Kasuo Hirai is handing over the reins to Chief Financial Officer Kenichiro Oshida. The company is currently heading towards a record year with projected annual profits of 6.6 billion US dollars. Yoshida will start his new role on the 1st of April. It's no joke. CNN's Cherise Pham has more from Hong Kong. The man who saved Sony is making way for a new leader. Sony announcing today that CEO Kazuo Hirai is handing over the reins to Chief Financial Officer Kenichiro Yoshida. Hirai is saying he's dedicated himself to transforming the company and making it profitable, saying it excites me to hear more and more people say that Sony is back again. Harai has led Sony through a stunning turnaround. When he took over as CEO in 2012, he inherited a business that had not turned a profit in four years. The Japanese company, once known for innovative gadgets like the Walkman, had turned into a stuffy conglomerate. Harai went about bringing Sony back from the brink. 
The company now consistently reporting huge profits. And he proved Sony could still be on the cutting edge, introducing gadgets like the PlayStation VR and relaunching Sony's robotic dog, Ibo. Harai steps down as CEO in April, but he won't be leaving Sony. He'll be staying on as chairman of the company he helped rescue. Sharice Pham, CNN, Hong Kong. Well, the UK is one of Switzerland's top trading partners, but with Brexit, the two will have to renegotiate many, many bilateral agreements. However, as long as Britain hasn't left the European Union, it's officially impossible to start the discussions and cut a deal. Coming up, we will ask what this all means for bilateral trade and Swiss business. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. No, it's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first cheque or cashing big cheques. To those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Quest Means Business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. programs are usually full of short stories that barely go beneath the surface. We give you the big picture every weekday evening at 7 p.m. The big picture goes deeper, looking at an issue from different angles and bringing you the guests that take time to speak, explain and elaborate. Our viewers get a deeper understanding of the day's issues and the context that underlies them. The big picture, weekdays from 7 to 8 p.m. It's high energy and fast paced, so buckle up as Front Seat brings you the latest news and views from the automotive world. Car developments, industry news, interviews with successful drivers, the latest trends and next level innovation here in Switzerland and around the world. On Front Seat, we'll keep you on the right road. Front Seat with Hannah Wise on CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, watch CNN Money Switzerland. You think you had a busy week? Hmm, well, think twice. Theresa May, the UK's Prime Minister, was in Davos for the World Economic Forum just last week and on Thursday she went to Beijing on her first official visit to China to meet with President Xi Jinping, looking to strengthen ties with trading partners outside the European Union. On the big picture tonight, we investigate where the relations stand between the two non-EU islands, the UK and Switzerland and how much remains to be renegotiated. Here's a quick explainer about the challenges the British government is facing regarding Brexit negotiations. 
The UK is supposed to leave the EU by March the 29th, 2019. What that really means is that it has to renegotiate a whole load of treaties by then. Not only will the UK need to strike a deal with the EU that every one of the remaining 27 members will accept, it'll also have to work out more than 600 treaties with around 150 countries outside of the Union. Some, like the rules of the procedure of the International Rubber Study Group, aren't exactly crucial. But say, if Britain wants to import Swiss watches, Cuban cigars, Argentinian garlic, Israeli oranges or even South African wine, basically anything that the country doesn't currently make, every one of those hundreds of trade deals will need to be renegotiated, if the country doesn't want to pay huge tariffs, that is. And that's just trade. The UK will also have to set up air service agreements with every country that it flies to. Or, on the 29th of March 2019, no international flights will be able to take off from any UK airports. Around 20% of Britain's energy comes from nuclear power, and the country's ageing stations rely on the US and other countries for spare parts. To keep those supplies coming, a new deal will need to be struck and then okayed by both President Trump and Congress. So, with time ticking, there's tremendous pressure to work towards those thousands of handshakes, or else the UK could find itself all alone on an economic island of its own making. Well, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union is undoubtedly impacting Switzerland. As we mentioned, bilateral deals ranging from air traffic, freedom of movement to scientific collaboration will need to be renegotiated. To ensure that the existing mutual rights and obligations between Switzerland and the UK will continue once the UK leaves the EU, Switzerland has adopted the so-called Mind the Gap strategy to make sure there is continuity in the discussions. During the recent British-Swiss Parliamentarians' Key Week, we had the rare chance to speak to the newly appointed Swiss ambassador to the UK, Alexandre Fasel. Take a listen here. Um, Brexit affects not only the relations between the United Kingdom and the European Union, but also all third countries that have bilateral treaties, trade treaties with the European Union and hence with the UK. So once the UK leaves, the uh, European Union, there is a gap uh, threatening, which is uh, then uh, of uh, considerable consequence for those economies. So Switzerland has this mind uh, the gap strategy, right? It wants to avoid any issues regarding rights and obligations after the UK leaves the European Union. How does this uh, strategy take shape? So the idea there is that we can guarantee continuity that in our relations with the UK, we can continue as we do now with them being members of the EU. So we have to bring in place, in time for the Brexit, a whole array of international uh, arrangements and legal disciplines that will come and replicate what we have now through their membership in the EU. How far have these uh, discussions progressed already? Because Brexit, according to Theresa May, is uh, set to start on the 29th of, Jan of March uh, 2019. The difficulty is that the uh, UK, as long as they haven't legally left the uh, European Union, they cannot negotiate with third countries. So uh, we have uh, exploratory talks, we um, call them continuity dialogue, where we analyse together what is at stake, which agreements, which legal disciplines do we need uh, to take over, to replicate, in what form, in what sort of bilateral uh, agreement. And that is what we are regularly discussing with the colleagues uh, in Whitehall. Coming back to the uh, Brexit impact, about 100,000 uh, jobs are created in the UK because of direct uh, investment uh, from Switzerland. Which are some of the key sectors uh, in Switzerland that will benefit or be harmed by the uh, UK's withdrawal from the European Union? The, the idea precisely is that uh, there will be no harm because we will be able, through the implementing of the Federal Council's uh, strategy, the Mind the Gap strategy, to have a legal continuity and, where possible, even to further expand and deepen the bilateral commercial and political ties with the UK. So that's what we are attempting to do. Are 
Switzerland and the UK allies or competitors in their relationship towards Brussels? I don't think we can look at the question in those categories. Uh, the third countries must find arrangements and accords with the European Union that respond uh, to their particular interests and political circumstances. So you can't really compare Switzerland and um, the United Kingdom. Do you think that after all Brexit will be good or bad for the Swiss economy? What I can say is that Brexit does affect all the third countries that have uh, trading relations and agreements with the EU. So the challenge here is uh, to make sure that we have a uh, continuity in our relations with the uh, UK as they leave the EU. Mm, well, in many ways, Switzerland finds itself in a similar position now as the UK in a couple of years. A close trading partner, yet not being part of the Union. A relationship that knows more than just a few ups and downs and with some seriously strained moments, as the recent dispute regarding the access of the Swiss market exchange in Europe just shows. At the Swiss Parliamentary Ski Week with Britain again earlier in January, I also caught up with the former British Labour party politician Dennis McShane, who, who was also a member of parliament and who recently wrote a book about Brexit. I started by asking him about what he thinks about the Swiss relationship with Brussels. I think Switzerland is a very important country. Its relationship with the EU is complicated. I think there are a lot of people in London who don't understand the Swiss-EU relationship. They think there's a magic formula that says, oh, we can have the same relationship as the Swiss have with the rest of Europe. But the plain fact is, as we see it on free movement, as we see it on stock exchange equivalents, uh, on all the bilateral agreements, the time is over when the European Union the Commission said, OK, uh, we'll have a private relationship with Switzerland. And I think actually Brexit has infected this and it might have been able to continue but now the Swiss are saying sorry now the Europeans the European Commission are saying to the British if you want to play in Europe trade in Europe have access to Europe you have to obey the common rule book uh, and uh, so I think this is a bad moment for collateral damage for Switzerland. Well, Switzerland has about 100 bilateral agreements with the European Union. Would this be something that the UK aspires to as well? We might have 1,000 or 10,000. I mean, there's something like 400,000 regulations on chemical uh, industry products. Now, you can't regulate a single British chemical 400,000 regulations that will correspond with the EU. It's much better, it always has been, to have an overall agreement and abide by the common rules. We can't go to America and say we will obey this law, this law, that law, but not that law, that law and that law. Sorry, the Americans will say you're joking. And the rest of Europe is saying to Britain, sorry, we respect your decision, but if you want to keep trading with us as you do today, you, you have to abide by most of our rules. I think, unfortunately, that's also the message to Switzerland, which up to now had a reasonably comfortable relationship with the rest of Europe, especially with all its neighbours. But now Brexit actually has done, I think, a lot of damage to the existing EU-Swiss relationship. Well, uh, last question about half of the uh, British citizens are, uh, you know, for another referendum, <laughs> right? Uh, first of all, do you think that this might actually still, you know, reverse uh, the trend uh, of, of Brexit? And second, how do you see uh, Theresa May's uh, future? It's fascinating to know. We've had three consultations on Europe. One in 1975, we said yes to Europe. One in 1983, an election where the Labour Party, my Labour Party, said, we must leave the European community. The British people said, you're joking. Then 2016, after an enormous amount of propaganda and money from abroad, then the British voted to leave, especially on the immigration question, which is sensitive in all of our countries. Now, I think there's a serious discussion in the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, saying, well, maybe we need a new consultation. On the future of Theresa May, she has what the French might call la faiblesse d'une forte. That's to say, she's weak, but also she's strong. Nobody really is there to replace her. I don't think she wants to enrol Britain in the equivalent of the Dignitas Clinic in Zurich, 
for economic suicide. The British business system, capitalism, if you want to use that word, survived for three centuries, linked with her Conservative Party, and already we've lost 1% of our GDP because of Brexit. And I think as the economic news gets more difficult, darker for Britain, uh, we'll see some rethinking. What form it takes, uh, I don't know. But I hope Britain and Switzerland, you know, in the next two, three, four, five years, can establish a positive relationship with the rest of the EU. Because if we split the Europe asunder, Switzerland suffers, Britain suffers, Germany, France suffers. But at the moment in England, we have a very, very anti-European sort of ideological base, almost a religious base that is controlling the political agenda. And we'll have much more on Brexit and Switzerland in just a moment when Jan Atteslander, the head of foreign trade at Economy Swiss, discusses the impact on Swiss companies doing business with the UK. Don't go away. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the map of Swiss warnings. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland. And south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. One of the top financial stories right now is the Apple earnings. CEO Tim Cook placed a big bet last year on the iPhone X. When it launched here in Switzerland, it had a price tag of more than 1,000 Swiss francs, as you know. Globally, Christmas sales of the smartphone gave Apple a boost as well. But now the company is forecasting weaker overall sales ahead. That's raising concerns about the demand for the new line of iPhones. Still, 88 billion in total sales is a record for Apple. CNN Money business and technology correspondent Samuel Berg is following the story. X doesn't mark the spot for Apple, even though they had record sales of $88 billion, which was no doubt in due partly to that $1,000 price tag for the iPhone 10. At the end of the day, Apple only sold 77 million iPhones, missing expectations of 80 million from Wall Street. Now, many analysts are attributing that lack of sales due to the fact that Tim Cook decided to launch two different iPhone models at once, the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, as well as the iPhone 10, and they worry that this caused confusion among consumers, not sure of which one to choose. They decided to stick with their older models. And speaking of older models, it was somewhat surprising to hear what Tim Cook said when asked on the call with analysts about the whole situation with slowing down the older models and having to offer batteries at a discounted price to replace the batteries that had slowed down. He said he's not sure what effect this will have on the company and that it wasn't part of their thinking when they decided to make this move to offer the batteries at a discounted price. One interesting tidbit came from the CFO of the company who talked about all of the cash that Apple has had overseas, which they can now bring home at a discounted price because of the Trump tax cuts. He says this gives them a lot of flexibilities as they look at all the options they have to deploy this capital. So maybe an acquisition or two or more out there. I'm Samuel Burke for CNN Money Switzerland. Back to you. 
Coming up after the break, we'll look into relations with one of Switzerland's biggest trading partners as it prepares to separate from the European Union. More on that in our interview with Jan Atteslander of Industry Lobby Group Economy Swiss. We try to be global and we try to be smart. What I want to hear are authentic voices of people who are passionate or intelligent, and that's the consistency that we try to get at. For Reed Zakaria GPS. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. What drives Swiss leaders? What is the secret to their success? In The Newsmaker, we speak to successful CEOs, entrepreneurs, politicians, decision makers, opinion leaders, sports and entertainment personalities. We find out what makes them tick in a special long-form interview that gets to the heart of who they are and where they are going. So pull up a chair and join us for The Newsmaker every weekday evening from 8 p.m. on CNN Money Switzerland. Somebody to, to tell you their story, it's, it's something I take really seriously. It's not something you can just parachute in and ask somebody to open their heart to you. To peel away the layers, to get to the heart of the person who you're telling a story about. France will never give up against the terrorists. And delve beneath the, the surface of what's happening. You can hear their story and you're going to do their story justice. You. you have to show yourself to Thank them. You. So right now they're hovering pretty low over this area that, that's uh, extensively flooded. CNN's the right place to tell their story. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. How do you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation, business opportunities anywhere. What drives the Swiss business world what makes the economy tick? And how do companies react to the ever-changing challenges of the market? We've got our finger on the Swiss polls. Well, we'll bring you the ups and downs, bulls and bears of the world of business, always asking what it means for you. The Swiss polls, weekdays from 6 to 9 p.m. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need, whenever, wherever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV, on our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. The best Swiss business news whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. Welcome back. Let's return now to our big picture topic of the day, Brexit and the impact on bilateral trade between the United Kingdom and Switzerland. So let's take a look at some key figures now. The UK is one of Switzerland's top trading partners. In 2016, the UK was Switzerland's third largest export market and its fourth largest supplier. That same year, the total trade volume reached 50 billion Swiss francs. For more, I spoke to Jan Atteslander, the head of foreign trade at Economy Swiss, a little earlier. The main risk for Swiss companies doing business in the UK is legal uncertainty. We do not really know right now what the landscape looks like after this date. Right now, we have on the table a transition agreement between the UK and the EU, fine. But we do not even know right now, is this only valid for the two or are also third countries involved and have the same privileges and obligations then? So this is right now at the moment a big topic for us. Now Switzerland really wants to ensure that the mutual responsibilities and rights and obligation will also apply after Brexit. It's the so-called mind the gap strategy. What are some of the main risks in this strategy? Absolutely. The main risk is that, as it is extremely complex, 
that as soon as the transition agreement gets into force, third countries might face an unclear situation. So, for example, custom procedures, rules of origin, or also for financial services, goods, what, what is really notified, what will be accepted by both the UK and the EU. We do not expect huge risk or problems, but it's a situation with many open questions and business people don't like it. It's extremely technical and yeah. very complex. How do you actually get an overview and how clear is the situation for Switzerland? Well, in Switzerland, we are in close contact with our member companies and there they have like, teams and they just work through a quite a complex agenda. And we do the same with our British partners, with business organizations. So we, we have quite a clear picture where problems might arise. Then we bring this to our governments and tell them, listen, this is your work now. Make sure that there's no gap and that business can continue as it does today. So I'm quite optimistic that this communication work is working, but the outcome at the end right now is not fully guaranteed. Now, Switzerland is often viewed as a model for the UK after Brexit uh, to you know, work as Switzerland with uh, its relationship uh, with the European Union. But is that not a, a competition situation that you know, Switzerland will become like a competitor for the UK or more like an ally in this regard? It will be both. Uh, competition is good for business and also to have another big third country in Europe is, is extremely helpful also for, for our colleagues in Norway, Liechtenstein and Iceland. So we are not the only ones and of course we used to have this, uh, this very close relationship before the UK joined the EEC at the time in the 70s. But you're right, I mean we have here a big new player outside the EU and it will be extremely important for both that we get along quite well and coordinate each other. Uh, we have too many common interests at the table and there are really high stakes for both countries, uh, Switzerland and the UK, also in the bilateral ties. So could you actually imagine that the two countries could be like non-EU islands that team up together, the UK and Switzerland, after Brexit? It's already now a situation, over the last years, we found out that very often there's one big player in the EU who knows, for example, how to talk about financial services because it's the most global financial place in the world. So there we had a natural partner. We didn't always agree, of course, but there we had a very strong partner. And this will, of course, continue. The same in, in the industrial era. The UK is known for being a high-tech leader in many areas. So the Switzerland is the same on a more humble level, let's say, but also there in many areas we had a natural partner to talk to. And of course, we think that this will be intensified now over the next years. Now, some people say that uh, the EU might actually not treat Switzerland much better than the UK and are really worried about that, such as the National Councillor um, uh, Isabel More told us earlier. Let's take a listen. Actually, Brexit has a really bad impact on our relationship on Europe because uh, we are discussing about our bilateral agreements with Europe. And now Europe say to us, oh, we have no time for you because we have to discuss for the Brexit with the UK and UK has no time for us too. And the problem is that our discussions with Europe cannot um, go positive for us because they cannot, Europe cannot give something to us because they are anxious to give too much and give something after to UK. So for us it's a big problem. So I hope it will go well and very fast with between Europe and UK. Do you agree with uh, Ms. Moret? Well, we talk to her on a regular basis. She is one of our board members. So yes, indeed, um, it's a typical triangular situation. And the idea is not that we get a better deal than the British or whatever. The idea is to have a big Europe that's competitive globally and we set the best possible framework condition for each other. No one takes an advantage if the UK is worse off than Switzerland or EU. This is, this is a wrong thinking at the moment. And this makes it so difficult for the politicians because they are more used to zero, uh, zero games. 
uh, zero-sum games where no one is, is uh, really uh, the winner. So what are you hoping to see from the Swiss politicians and the government? What kind of attitude at this point in time? Right now, our ministries are heavily involved to have an uh, intense dialogue with the UK to explore the possibilities of a future arrangement and at the same time, time make sure that also Brussels and the EU finds this a good idea because we all sit here on, in Europe and we have all the common interest that this works out fine for our business and the economy. Otherwise, we all take a big damage. You are the head of foreign trade at Economy Suisse. So let's take a look at foreign trade. Now, the UK is a key trading partner for Switzerland and also the third largest export market. What kind of impact will Brexit have on bilateral trade volumes? That's really difficult to say right at the moment. We will see some trade changes, of course, that probably some goods that have gone to the UK and then resold or re-exported to EU countries will not take place anymore. But I think as long as UK continues to be one of the top places to do business, both in financial services, insurance services and in the production and design of industrial goods, I think this is going to continue. But we are still worried because, as I said before, the framework conditions are really open to us, so we do not know. And what's also quite unclear right now, what will be the policy after Brexit, after the transition period in the UK itself? And Swiss companies are also worried. What do you tell them? We tell them um, right now it's, it's the time uh, to look closely at the business model. Where do you have risk to be hurt? If something changes or something does not work uh, the way it should, where are potential barriers to business models? Very often um, today in global supply chains, you have a supply chain that runs twice through Switzerland, Germany, France, then to UK and back and forth. And here you are a bit vulnerable because all of a sudden the rules change and the game might be a different one. And this, this is not that easy for the companies to sort out and find out and uh, they react to it now. FTP National Councillor Krista Markwalder spoke exactly on that topic. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. And so for Switzerland, this means, especially for the international operating company, that they are considering how to go on with their investments. They probably uh, are uh, not investing more right now until there is a certain big picture how the future model looks like. What do you think about her remarks here? It's absolutely correct. Uh, Krista points here to a very important thing. I think globally all the investors currently start holding back the breath, watching what's going on. And I think the next important cornerstone will be the summit in Europe, uh, end of March, 21st, 22nd March, when they have the transition agreement and the exit bill. And then starting the, ne the negotiations on the final arrangement between European Union and UK. And as soon as this gets a bit clearer, I think investors will rethink about it. But currently, we also get more and more signals. I just come out of a meeting where big investors start putting a question mark and start with contingency plans. They start getting ready to transfer personnel and investment back to the continent. And this is a, a direct consequence of this uncertainty for the moment. It really is a doom and gloom situation at this point, but some people think there are also positives in that equation. What are some of the positives and do you agree with those uh, who are uh, not so uh, pessimistic? Absolutely. Um, um, we keep saying if there is a crisis, make sure you don't miss it. And, um, of course, there, there will be uh, some positive aspects. I'll give you an example. UK government has already made it very clear that they will think about a new tax scheme for international business that will make it much more attractive. It's absolutely clear that parts of big parts, let's say 80% of the city that is globally oriented, will take no big damage. They might even see more investments uh, in, in the city. But um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to say at the moment. Um, and, and also, it all depends. Will the UK as a country be still open for the top brains in the world? If it continues, then it will be a continued success story. If not, 
um, then they will run into big difficulties. Well, some people actually argue that Switzerland could benefit from Brexit because some of the uh, companies that are currently in the city of London might decide to move their headquarters to Switzerland. I don't, th I don't think so. Moving a headquarter is quite a big exercise. And um, honestly, we have the same companies both in Switzerland and in London. Uh, they are active, the global ones, the big ones, and also medium-sized ones are really active in Switzerland, the UK, in Europe. It might be possible that they reshuffle, but, uh, but um, I do not think that we will take a considerable advantage of this situation and, uh, when the UK runs into difficulties. Our main competitors are outside Europe. That's our big worry. If this exercise is not well managed, then Asia and the Americas will take an advantage out of it, not Europe. Even the Swiss banking giants like UBS or Credit Suisse, at an early stage, they threatened to cut jobs in London and even move uh, their operations somewhere else. Do you, in that case, think a city like Hong Kong would be attractive for them as well, Abs if not Switzerland? Absolutely. I mean, this is already happening that uh, big service providers go where the markets are and where the growth is and the clients. So they have to move to places like Singapore, Hong Kong and Shanghai. That's where the growth really is happening currently. And then, of course, um, this is um, a big challenge for us as Europeans to make sure that this does not even happen more to a bigger extent just because of Brexit. It really sounds like Europe is going to be a continent of losers at the end of the day. How can you stay competitive in Europe and Switzerland as a financial center especially? This is an absolutely key point. Politicians should stop thinking about Europe alone and isolate. This will lead to a lose-lose situation. Now they should sit together and think about in the long term, what do we do now to make sure that Europe is a winner? It doesn't make sense to punish business or business environment just because someone decided to leave a club. We must make sure that Europe as a whole remains an attractive place. Everyone is affected by Brexit because the UK uh, um, economy is so big. And uh, if we don't manage it well, others outside Europe will take a big advantage. And this, this is our worry at, at the moment that European politicians keep forgetting this point. Now, everybody in Europe sits in the same boat uh, with regards to the negotiations uh, with the European Union together with uh, the UK. Who should move first? And does anybody have a uh, you know, first mover advantage? That's tricky. I mean, there's the political big show. Um, we will see many dramas in, in, in over the next 18 months. But leave it to the specialists and the experts on the government level to work it out and make sure that it is finally done in, in a very good way. Otherwise, we run into difficulties. And I'm, I'm quite confident these people are around. We have enough knowledge on good policy making here in Europe. We also should know what not to do. So I'm quite confident here that it's not a technical question. It's rather, is there a political will to stop the blame and shame game and do now the job as politicians have to do it. But should Switzerland not move first in this neck-to-neck -neck race uh, with the UK and others uh, with regards we, to the European Union? We are moving. We have excellent contacts, both the government and also business. We are in a constant exchange of views. Uh, papers are exchanged. There are quite concrete talks now. We don't call them negotiations because it's the wrong time now. And Switzerland will be among the first group that will see negotiations then later that year or early next year with the UK government. I would say this is our expectation. This is going to happen. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Atislander. Thank you, Mrs. Fuchs. Well, Brexit is not the only departure being hotly debated in the British Parliament. UK lawmakers are discussing whether to move out of the Palace of Westminster for up to six years, while major repairs are underway. Cameras are rarely allowed inside this historic palace, but this rare glimpse shows why multi-billion dollar repairs are needed. CNN correspondent Max Foster reports from London. It is one of the most iconic buildings in the world. But look closely, and the Palace of Westminster is falling apart. 
A rare glimpse inside these walls shows that behind the imposing exterior, beneath the ornate arches and stained glass lobbies, cracks are beginning to show. The patch and mend method adopted over the centuries no longer able to keep up. Lawmakers were warned in a recent report that the building faces a growing risk of catastrophe unless urgent work is carried out. So Andy, we're on the roof and you get a real sense here about the scale of the problem you're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, what you can see here is the damage that's caused 150 years worth of use out of Victorian, you know, cast iron roofing system. And it kind of represents what the age and condition of the rest of the building is. The building has seen prime ministers come and go, some leaving more of an impact than others. The decades have taken their toll and the British weather has too. Water seeps through the roof in many places. Well, rare access indeed. This is what the whole project really comes down to. The Commons Chamber, where British laws are so famously debated, you can almost hear the noise. In the chamber, questions to the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And Prime Minister is frankly in denial of it. This chamber could fall silent for six whole years under a proposal to move MPs out to allow for a multi-billion dollar overhaul. This kind of work is what you might think of as um, surgery to the major arteries and veins and major organs of this building. What it is not in any way, shape or form, a facelift or a makeover. It's not until you go underground that you really see why this proposed work is so critical and so complex. Well, we come down to the basement and we found a typical sort of problem, really. Some evidence of a leak here. And we've discovered it's coming from a pipe right up in there, but they can't get to it because of this massive cabling. A lot of it don't know where it goes. We don't know what it's for, so you can't just rip it out because it could cause all sorts of other problems. The 19th century building is struggling to keep up with the modern world. This is our current telephony system, which is in desperate need for a replacement. The tangle of phone lines, not a reassuring sight for anyone trying to get in touch with their MP. Officials would like to make Westminster ready for the future, whilst restoring a key piece of Britain's past. Max Foster, CNN, London. Well, staying with iconic buildings, and you probably immediately recognize the one behind me. The Sistine Chapel in Vatican City is one of the world's most popular tourist attractions. It too requires constant maintenance and attention. As CNN's Delia Gallagher explains in her exclusive Behind the Scenes report. The Sistine Chapel is getting a checkup. For a whole month each year from 5.30 to midnight, when all the tourists are gone, a team from the Vatican comes in to clean it, check for damage, and report on the health of some of the world's most treasured art. It's a painstaking process. Scaffolding must be erected and taken down each night and cannot be attached to the walls to avoid damaging the paintings. One of the biggest problems of the Sistine Chapel is humidity. 25,000 visitors a day pose a risk for the paintings. You know, our bodies are made of water. So when we visit the Sistine Chapel, uh, we bring in humidity. And we heat. Uh, everybody heat the environment like a, a bulb, you say, 80 watt bulb. Humidity causes condensation and a veil of salt forms on the famous frescoes painted in the 14 and 1500s, which damages the color and the plaster it's painted on. A laborious technique brushing distilled water onto thin Japanese paper removes the salt layer. To combat humidity, there are 30 hidden sensors measuring temperature, air circulation, and number of visitors in the chapel. Dr. Victoria Cimino, the Vatican's conservationist, monitors the air quality in the chapel. The temperature must be between 22 to 24 degrees Celsius. Humidity must be medium high. They are very precise markers and we have to verify that the system respects them. The frescoes in this chapel are over 500 years old. Now back then there was no artificial lighting. The only light that came in was daylight through these upper windows. And of course being the Pope's private chapel, far fewer people came through here 
as well. So cleaning and restoration wasn't really a priority then. Today, with new technology and lighting, not only is there better cleaning, but it has revealed to restores the original colors used by Michelangelo. The world was shocked after a cleaning and restoration in the 90s to discover that Michelangelo actually used vivid greens, purples and reds, because for centuries it was assumed that he painted in dark, subdued tones. But that was only the accumulation of dirt and grime. The next time you're in the Sistine Chapel, look out for this. Little black marks, squares and triangles on some of the paintings. They're called witnesses, deliberately left as evidence for future restorers to give an idea of just how dark the paintings were before. To make sure the colors stay vibrant, a color team measures any changes to tone by taking pictures of the frescoes with a multi-wavelength camera, which is then analyzed by a computer. Dr. Fabio Moresi is in charge of color analysis. We can see the color of every single pixel and compare it throughout the years. It's important because we can detect any changes even before they are visible to the human eye. A behind-the-scenes labor of love so that the past may continue to brighten our future. Delia Gallagher, CNN, Rome. And that was it for the big picture. Next up is the newsmaker with my colleague Hannah Weiss. Have a great weekend. Goodbye. Money is more than just currency. It is the fuel for how we live our lives. It connects us. It drives us. It buys us things. But it is more than that. It is who we are and what we want. <laughs> Money isn't everything, but it is everywhere. And so are we. We are younger, we are richer, and we are smarter. We are money. CNN Money. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. On our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. I'm seeing Shanghai the old fashioned way. CNN Business Traveler in China. By the end of the next decade, the largest aviation market in the world. Are you ready for that? Businesses are spreading their wings. China Eastern, keeping the Chinese sky safe. <laughs> New ways to earn miles. Are you still a mileage geek? Yes, always. And bridging culture gaps. Don't ask. On the next CNN Business Traveler. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, watch CNN Money Switzerland.
Creating a new generation of coders, the CEO of the Swiss-based Kudelski Group thinks more children should learn how to program software. Andre Kudelski talks to us in our Newsmaker Hour about the importance of unlocking our digital potential. Fundamentally, there is a lack of uh, uh, urgency sense regarding the digitalization in Europe and Switzerland in particular. And here I think that will take some time, but it's really important once more when Switzerland is sitting in the driver's seat. And it's been a roller coaster of a week on the markets, and today is no different. Bitcoin is on track for its worst week since 2013. Cryptocurrencies across the board take hits. All the analysis you need is coming up on the program. Good evening, I'm Hannah Wise, and you're watching The Newsmaker. February, you're watching the Newsmaker Hour here on the Swiss Pulse. We start with a roundup of the main news headlines. For the last two days, five of the Swiss Air Force's FA-18 Hornets have been grounded after investigators found cracks in the landing gear. Just last week, its aircraft were protecting airspace above the World Economic Forum. In December, the Swiss government announced plans to spend 8 billion Swiss francs on new fighter jets. That after voters rejected a 3.1 billion Swiss francs order for jets back in May 2014. Several Swiss banks are refusing to transfer assets belonging to Saudi clients detained during a recent crackdown on corruption. That's according to a report in Geneva newspaper Le Ton. Earlier reports said that the new Saudi regime under Mohammed bin Salman had pressured clients to repatriate funds from Swiss accounts. The Geneva paper cited sources saying Rehad uh, planned to confiscate the assets. UBS, Pictet, Lombard Odier and Credit Suisse are among the banks mentioned in the report. An upward swing in, uh, or revision in economic growth in Germany could help Chancellor Angela Merkel hammer out a coalition deal with the country's Social Democrats. The government raised its forecast by half a percent after positive economic data pointed to added tax revenues. Talks on ending over four months of political limbo are likely to stretch into next week. However, despite agreements on education, migration and pensions. Good news this Friday coming from South Africa after nearly a thousand gold miners trapped underground were finally rescued. The workers at Sibanyi Stillwater Mine were trapped last Wednesday after a power failure prevented elevators from bringing them to the surface. Safety at mines in South Africa has been an ongoing issue with some 80 recorded fatalities last year. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has announced an ambitious plan to give hundreds of thousands of poor and vulnerable families free health care. The plan, dubbed Modi Care, would cover hospital costs of up to half a million rupees every year, which translates to around 7,800 US dollars. That's more than 15 times the amount poor families can currently claim from the government. Access to health care is a major problem in India, but if the programme gets the go-ahead, it could cost $780 billion, which is a huge part of the country's $2.4 trillion economy. Now, ever thought of sending your kids to a coding class? Well, this is exactly what Andre Kudelski, chairman and CEO of Swiss software and cybersecurity giant Kudelski Group, is advocating. Even though engineering and data science boot camps are booming in the country, Switzerland still has a lot of catching up to do if it wants to get into pole position in the digital space. Our Newsmaker interview is coming up. That's right after this short break. Let's talk tech. Do you want to see the latest gadgets? Understand where robotics will take us next? 
find out more about the pioneers and their latest research, join us on Tech Talk, where we'll be meeting the people behind the big ideas here in Switzerland and around the world and finding out what it means for businesses, consumers, and the planet. Tech Talk with Anna Maria Montero on CNN Money Switzerland. you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation. Business opportunities anywhere. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. No, it's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first check or cashing big checks. To those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Quest Means Business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. I've spent all of my career in the field, and I think that informs who I want to talk to, but more importantly, who wants to and who accepts to talk to me. And I hope that what I bring to the table is a rigorous search for the truth and a rigorous determination and an effort to hold power accountable. Aman Paul. The Swiss Pulse delivers you the most important global and Swiss business and financial news. Connect